things up. The older you get, the worse it is. <laughs> well, good. <clears throat> Welcome to worship this morning. It's good to be with you. Good to uh, celebrate uh, God's grace. It's good to celebrate His providential gifts, the rain that you sent. He has sent once again. We're thankful for it. So it's good to be with you. I have no announcements. Let's unite our hearts in a moment of prayer. worship this morning comes from Isaiah 12. In that day, and I consider this one of those days as God's people come together, in that day you will say, I will praise you, O Lord. Although you were angry with me, your anger has turned away and you have comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. People of God, receive this greeting. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and always. Amen. As God has greeted us, let's greet one another. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Let's sing those words together.
seated. Looking for passages to read at a time like this, I opened the book of Hosea and I found words of assurance of what God was going to do for his people in uh, chapter 14, but then I thought there's somewhere he's going to talk about the need, the need that God's people have for his redeeming, sanctifying, cleansing grace. And so I read, found that in chapter 8. Put a trumpet to your lips. An eagle is over the house of Israel because the people have broken my covenant and rebelled against my law. Israel cries out to me, O oh, our God, we acknowledge you, but Israel has rejected what is good. An enemy will pursue him. They set up kings without my consent. They choose princes without my approval. With their silver and gold, they make idols for themselves to their own destruction. Throw away your idol calf, O Samaria, my anger burns against them. How long are they incapable of purity? They are from Israel. The calf, a craftsman has made it, it is not God. It would be broken to pieces, that call of Samaria. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you made a covenant with our first parents. You called them to obedience, to listen to your law, to not eat of that tree, but they did and brought into your creation sin, darkness, and death. And Father, that shadow of death hangs over us. Father, we are unable on our own to satisfy your standards of purity. We have broken covenant with you too. We've made idols out of things out of balls that bounce, and clubs that hit little balls, our crops, our cars, our tractors, our money in the bank. Father, we confess that we too need your forgiving grace, your healing in Jesus Christ. So Father, we come together today to thank you that we know this Jesus, and we'll be hearing more about him Father, help us to receive what you have done for us. For you've done for us what we cannot do for ourselves. So increase and encourage our faith and our hope as we hear what you promised to do for your people in the days and centuries ahead through Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. And then that passage that I found, first of all, from Isaiah 14. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. Your sins have been your downfall. Take words with you and return to the Lord. These words, say to him, forgive all our sins and receive us graciously that we may offer the fruit of our lips. Assyria cannot save us. We will not mount war horses. We will never again say our gods to what our hands have made. For in you the fatherless find compassion. I will heal their waywardness and love them freely. For my anger has turned away from them. Let's sing now the words of the marvelous grace of God.
Let's unite our hearts, quiet our hearts in a time of prayer. Father, we stand in awe of that gospel, that, that good news, that, that expression of marvelous grace as we see it, as we receive it through the work of your spirit, as we see it in Jesus Christ, his death, his resurrection for us. Father, may that good news ever sink deeper and deeper into our hearts and in our lives, our thinking about our future, our thinking about ourselves, our thinking about how we stand with you. May that expression of your grace, that marvelous grace, shape our hope, shape who we are, shape how we live, how we serve, how we love. May that expression of grace also move us to be people who recognize that as a church we have a mission. We have a gospel to proclaim, a gospel to, to finance with our gifts, a gospel that folks that we send out bring. People who represent our denomination, people who represent us as a church, people who represent our classes, people who represent the church of Jesus Christ in the world. Bless the mission of your church. Spread your gospel. Touch hearts and lives with your spirit and your truth so that many may come to know the truth and be set free. Father, we look at our world, especially at our own country, and there's a lot of anti-God stuff, anti-creator God stuff going on and proclaimed and demanded an allegiance to. A lot of brokenness, a lot of rejection of your word. Father, we pray for our land. We pray for evangelists and pastors and Christians everywhere to leave an example of godliness, holiness, and a desire to proclaim that good news, that truth without fear. Send out your spirit to open hearts and minds that in our world people may return back to you. The Father, heal our nation, its brokenness, its divis divisiveness, bring people together at, at the level, national level, federal level, state level, education level, bring people back together around your truth, and not some of the, and not a, no longer around some of these strange ideas that are being promoted by so many. So Father, we pray that you will bless the folks in charge, folks who have, we have elected to serve, help them to serve well with, with wisdom, with righteousness, with justice. We pray that you will give wisdom to those who have to deal with the border issues. And, and we pray for wisdom there to make good decisions and do the right thing there. We pray, Father, that you'll bring peace to your world, bring an end to this war in Ukraine. We pray, Father, that you will provide there, that you will take the desire out of the hearts of potentates and dictators who, who rule for their own legacy. Take that desire out of their hearts and move them toward peace. But bless your world, bless your gospel in your world. Thank you, Father, for your care over us throughout this past week. We thank you for vacations that we returned from. We thank you for blessings on the work that we did. We thank you for the rain that you have sent once again to refresh the earth. And we stand amazed as we watch the corn grow and the soybeans. And we recognize that we've entrusted this seed to the soil and you have, you have so far blessed us. 
perhaps far more than we deserve. And so, Father, we pray for a good harvest, and we pray for wisdom that we may be good stewards of that which you give to us. Bless this congregation. Pray for all the folks who have special needs in their lives. We pray for little Emmett. We pray that you will bless the doctors as they deal with this rare blood disease of this child. We pray that things may be able to be turned around for him in your grace and mercy. Bless the parents as they, and grandparents as they go through this with them. Father, we pray for the, the missionaries that you have sent, Steve and Cara in Texas. We pray, Father, that you will bless them. And, and we pray, Father, that you will care for Sauce and Cara as they prefer, prepare to, turn to return to West Africa, too, to be missionaries. Uh, bless them. Bless all of those, uh, we pray, who need you in any special way. The, the, the churches in the community, we pray for blessing on each one. Those that are vacant, they may soon receive pastors, give wisdom to the consul to lead. We pray that churches may grow, that people may grow in their faith and their witness. Bless this congregation then, all who need you in any special way. We commend them to your care. Those who are shut in, who cannot get out, we pray for them, care for them too, we pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you will give wisdom to the consul as they give good leadership here. Pray for Pastor Bob. As he ministers here, we pray that you will continue to bless his ministry, to encourage us, to lift us up, to help us to feel good about ourselves as your children, redeemed by your grace, called to holiness. So receive our worship today. Bless our gifts and the giving of gifts. May we do this to your honor and glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our offering will be received for Lebanon Budget and Atlas of Sioux Center.
Our Bible reading for this morning is from Luke 18, 18 to 30. I have it on page 972 in this Bible here. You wish to fall. Before we read, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, help us to uh, deal with your word correctly, honestly, to hear what you say to us. We live in a world that distracts us in so many ways, a world that puts a lot of emphasis on human activity and humans doing the right thing and humans achieving for themselves. But Father, we live under your grace where you do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Help us to understand. May it shape our lives and our hope in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so the story goes like this. A certain ruler asked Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not give false testimony, honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, who then can be saved? Jesus replied, what is impossible for man is possible with God. Peter said to him, we have left all we had to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus said to them, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. May God bless his word. People of God, in a, in a former church we served, there was a man who it seemed qualified to be called a self-made millionaire. He started out as a young man selling onions that the farmers raised in the muck land, the old river bottom ground next to town. And then he processed and he sorted and he packaged these onions and sold them into to grocery stores. He started his business in the garage. It soon expanded, so he had to expand too. He bought land, built a plant, put in the machinery, hired the workers, and soon he became known as the Onion King. His packaged onions were shipped all over western Michigan, into Indiana, Ohio, into the Chicago area. He became a very wealthy man built his a house in the choice part of town, a nice home. As a hobby, he collected vintage automobiles, old Cadillacs, Imperials, Lincolns. And in, his eight, in his 80s, he still went to the plant every day to check on, see how it was go, doing. After supper, he would go back to the plant and make sure the, the boys had shut all the doors and locked them. Finally, he got to too old to do that anymore, too weak, lost his eyesight. At 87, he passed away. For his funeral, I selected this passage of Scripture from Luke 18, 18 to 30. The story of a rich man who asked a very important question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, maybe you think, and maybe you're right, it was kind of mean for me to uh, choose this passage of Scripture for this man's funeral, because his family heard what Jesus said about this rich ruler. 
how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. This man's son admitted to me afterwards that he began to squirm when that text was read. He wondered if the preacher was going to give that fa his father's family any hope of his father entering the kingdom of God. He said he was quite uneasy until, until he heard the gospel in this passage. So my question to all of us this morning is, have we heard the gospel in this passage we read? Let's listen to this conversation between Jesus and this rich ruler. It's an important conversation. The rich ruler came to Jesus with his question, a question that raises the concern that many folks have today. It's a question about assurance. Assurance as to whether they've done the right thing in order to qualify for an inheritance of eternal life after they pass away. Maybe that's a question that still bothers us. We have doubts sometimes, don't we? We have questions sometimes. Sometimes when life is hard, we wonder if God is for us or against us. Sometimes we think of, the, of some of the dumb things we've said or the bad things we've done or we wish we had done something different and we ask ourselves, how can a, how can a Christian do those kinds of things or say those kinds of things in the, in the heat of anger or whatever? Maybe we feel sometimes a lack of faith on our part. Maybe we, as many folks do, we still operate by the rules. We wonder if we've been obedient enough, if we followed the law with enough precision, with, with enough intentionality. Have we loved enough? Have we sacrificed enough? Maybe have we suffered enough? Maybe we wonder if we've done enough good with that which the Lord has blessed us with. Perhaps we worry that our lack of enthusiasm for this cause or that cause that other people are getting so excited about, is that lack of enthusiasm going to disqualify us? Maybe we even worry sometimes if our wealth is somehow going to disqualify us from inheriting the kingdom of heaven. So this rich man comes to Jesus with this very important question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, to answer the man's question, Jesus goes back to the law. Back to the way this man had been raised and trained and taught. After a little exchange about why this man calls Jesus good, which we won't get into now, Jesus said to him, you, you do know the commandments, don't you? And then he proceeds to quote several commandments from the second table of the law, to which the man replies, I have kept these since I was a boy. This is how he was trained. This is what the rabbis taught him. He learned the commandments. He memorized them. He knew them by heart. And as far as he knew, he had kept them from the time he was little. As, at, a, at a somewhat superficial level, I suppose, and in a legalistic way, he had kept the commandments. Now, some folks might be pretty hard on this, this rich ruler. They may call him arrogant and presumptuous and, and accuse him of making a preposterous claim, but I believe he was sincere. He honestly believed that according to how he had been taught, how he had been raised, how he had lived, he had done quite well. We might say that according to the rules in which he had been raised, he had done enough to inherit eternal life. But then, but then there was this Jesus, this fellow from Nazareth, this rabbi gathering a crowd, gaining a following. He seemed to have a, a different story to tell, a different, a different message. Maybe, maybe he has something that I ought to know. 
Maybe he has some more uh, rules that I should be obeying or one law that's more important than all the rest that I should be obeying in order to have, have, have good assurance. Well, Jesus did have more for him. So you think you've kept the commandments? You feel good about having kept the law of God since the time you were little? Good. However, there's one thing you lack. Sell all that you have and give to the poor and then come, follow me. That will ensure you of eternal life. And that's when the face of the rich man took on a look of sadness. His shoulders slumped and he shuffled away. He's unwilling to part with his wealth. And that's when Jesus made these very, uh, uh, said these very discouraging things. How hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom. You see, there was one law that he was not keeping. The heart of all these commandments that he had been taught since the day he was a boy, it was the law of love. If the law, if, if eternal life could be inherited by obedience to the law, then how, how can you keep all your wealth in the light of all those needs around you? The law of God carried a burden of love that this rich man had not yet understood and was not well, willing to bear. I, he could say, I've kept all these commandments from my youth, but Jesus could say, really, you don't understand them. How can you keep your wealth and use none of it for the poor and still say you've kept all the commandments? There's a depth to obedience to the commandments that, that you have not fathomed. He should have sat at Jesus' feet during the Sermon on the Mount. He maybe would have understood better. But now Jesus is not picking on this man because he's rich, but using him as an example of how human beings cannot inherit eternal life by obedience to the law. There's a burden of love that goes with this man's wealth and, and, and all of our wealth in the face of needs around us. But if we're unwilling to use that to meet needs, we're not really obeying the commandments. If it's all for myself, we, we're not living up to the law of love. But the problem with this man was that he was not only unable to part with his wealth, he's unwilling. To do that would mean he would have to find some other object of trust, some other object of love and trust. And as it is, he sees no need for that. And that's the, that's the greatest temptation with wealth. I don't need anything else. I have everything I need. It's like the rich man who had this big crop one fall, and he said, you know, I got, I'm going to build big barns and big store places, storehouses, and, and I'm going to put it all there, and I'm going to sell it off as I need it. I don't need anything more. And Jesus said, you fool, you fool, tonight you die. So there's two kinds of, of, of trust that prevents this man from, this rich man from being able to inherit eternal life. The first is the trust that he's kept all these commandments from his youth, which he had not. And the second is that trust in his wealth, the love of what he had that prevents him from being willing to part with it and, and follow a new object of trust. Such a person, said Jesus, and he put it very tellingly, such a person, he said, resembles a camel trying to go through the eye of a needle. He, this is an example to all who attempt to inherit eternal life by following the law. It's like a camel going through the eye of a needle. And that's a literal camel, and it's a literal eye of a needle. The camel in the zoo that spits at you if you get too close, and the needle that mom used to sew a button on your shirt. It's absurd to think that a camel could get through the eye of a needle. Now, some folks have tried to water this down by making the eye of a needle a, a, a narrow, low entrance beside a, a, the main gate of a city which a, a smallish camel could possibly squeeze himself through. 
And people do this to leave room, you know, for the possibility that a really good person might inherit eternal life by being a good person, by obeying the commandments. Sometimes you read obituaries, you kind of get that impression that this is what the thinking of people. He was such a good person. He made it on his own. But folks, it's a real camel, and it's a real eye of a needle. This is how difficult it is for anyone, rich or poor, to enter the kingdom of God by obedience to the law. We are unable, and we're unwilling. So this leaves a lot of people discouraged. It did the disciples, as well as the people who were in Jesus' audience that day. <clears throat> Excuse me. A sense of uneasiness settled over the crowd as it did over that family at that funeral on January 23, 1996. How can anybody then be saved, the disciples asked. And they had been with Jesus for, for, for several years. How can anyone then be saved? Hadn't they heard? Hadn't they understood? How can anyone inherit eternal life? Well, remember, I asked at the beginning if we had heard the gospel as we read this passage of Scripture. Did you? Here it is. To the encouragement of the crowd and to answer his disciples' question, Jesus replied, What is impossible with man is possible with God. For people brought up in an achievement-oriented religion as the rich ruler and his his Jewish com compatriots had, as some people like us have been, an achievement-oriented yeah, achievement religion. We're taught to be good. Parents used to tell us, now be good. Boy, good boys and girls go to heaven. We ever left the impression that we somehow could achieve it if we were just obey the rules. To people like us, Jesus came, and in his coming, declared what man cannot do for himself, God did. What's impossible for human beings is only and graciously possible with God. Inheriting eternal life is no longer about achieving. It's about receiving. Receiving by faith what God has done. Eternal life enters our lives as a, as a living hope because of what God in Jesus Christ has done for us. And what God has done cannot be bought, cannot be earned, it can only be received by faith. Of course, what is impossible for us, as impossible as a camel squeezing through the eye of a needle, is our own fault. We lost that ability to love God above all and our neighbor as ourselves. We broke covenant with God. We failed to keep his law, we could not. John Calvin wrote that it was through our own efforts, or rather, it's through our own fault, our own fault that it became necessary for us to receive as a gift what we cannot obtain by our efforts. But notice the word that the rich ruler asked in his question. He used the word inherit. Maybe he was answering his own question without really understanding. No one deserves an inheritance. Oh, a lot of people think they do. I was the favorite son. I was the favorite daughter. I was the favorite nephew. I, I, I deserve that inheritance because I looked after that person more than anybody else, this type of thing. It's always a gift, however. Inheritance is always a gift from mom and dad, grandpa and grandma, for, or maybe from rich Aunt Susie, who said I was her favorite nephew. It's always a gift. And so when the rich man asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? As many people may ask. Jesus is in effect saying, it's impossible for you to do anything to earn eternal life. It's a gift. It's an inheritance. It's something you are unable and unwilling to do on your own. You can only receive what God alone has done. And what God alone in Christ has made possible, eternal life. And you receive that by turning your trust, your love, 
away from all the distractions of this life, whether that's your wealth, your achievements, your family, your sacrifices, and you come. Follow me. You follow me in trust, in love, and in faith. And then at the end of the story, we hear from Peter, who seems like he just got it. You know, if it's possible for a fisherman like me, it's possible for you. We have left all to follow Jesus. You too can leave all. You can stop trusting in wealth and achievements and sacrifices and look to Jesus as Savior and Lord. And then Jesus adds his voice to Peter's testimony. Those who leave all, who stop trusting in wealth and achievement and follow me in faith, will not fail to receive more in this life than they have left, and afterwards, eternal life. So we need to ask ourselves, did we hear the gospel in this exchange between this rich ruler and, and Jesus? Very simply put, what's impossible for man is possible with God. <clears throat> What we could not do for ourselves, God by grace through Jesus Christ did for us. And so for these folks, the Jewish folks, the rich ruler and his, his kin, the, role, the rules have changed for inheriting eternal life. It's changed from impossible achievement to faith-filled receiving of what God in Christ has done for us. But really, that's always been God's rules. He said to old father Abraham long ago, the just shall live by faith. And then when he gave us his law, what's the order of, of, of statements in that law? Honor your father and your mother. Do not commit adultery. Do, not do, do this. Then you will receive a deliverance, an inheritance. Now, God started with the deliverance. <clears throat> I am the God who brought you out of Egypt. I am the God who brought you out of the land of slavery. Then, serve me alone. Have no other gods before me, and you know the law. Sometimes folks get what we call the, the, the cart before the horse. We must keep it straight. God's redemptive grace, His work for us in Jesus Christ, earns for us eternal life. And then... In response of gratitude, we follow him. So may we all who are called to follow Jesus, follow him in love and trust and faith, and thus, by God's grace, receive what we cannot inherit. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this, for this <clears throat> experience that Jesus had with the rich man in his day. It's... it's speaks volumes to us. We're compared to so many folks around. We are rich people, well-blessed. But Father, we too can get distracted as many folks do. Sometimes we get distracted by calls to obedience, call to holiness that make us believe we can somehow do it on our own. But Father, as your people, we come to you today and we thank you with all our hearts for doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. So Father, may our faith be a faith where we receive what we cannot achieve. We are blessed with what we could not earn. That, you were given, that we were given an inheritance that came to us by grace through Jesus Christ. Help us to follow Jesus' at, at words then, to come, come, follow me. Follow me in faith. By the power of your Spirit, make it so for all of us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>
Revelation chapter 1. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, and the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amen.